episode was a great episode. Russell uh, Rhodes, uh, 201 million, six, you know, 579 deals. Today's episode's a little bit different, man. Uh, I got this guy in the Hamptons, um, and uh, this guy does ultra luxury. And I know that uh, I know that some of you guys are out there. You're in a second home market. You're in a luxury market, and uh, you know maybe uh, or maybe maybe you're not. Maybe you have pockets of luxury, and you know you have your eye on those million dollar or multi million dollar houses, and you're like, how do I break in? So, so th- again, that's why I bring these people on. Now, I, I don't know if I told you this. Uh, well, let me back up. Let me give you just a brief overview. So today's guest, he's in the $1 billion club. Again, ultra luxury. We talk a little bit about, about uh, new construction. And he's got an interesting background. He was a, came, he was a tennis pro. Uh, his dad was a concert violinist and, and played highline to two crazy things that I don't, don't you know are completely in uh, opposition to one another in terms of personality. But a tennis pro to professional real estate agent. Now, um, again, this is what I was going to say a minute ago. I don't know that I've told you guys this or not, but you know, when I bring people like Russell on, uh, or Jim O'Neill or, you know, all these guys, Chantel Ray, you know, Ryan Finch, and they're like, Hey, we, we put up 900 transactions. Um, that's great radio. That's great content. Um, but if you're out there and you're doing 10 deals or 20 deals, you know, and I got an email from a guy and he's like, Hey, Toby, look, man, um, what about if you haven't done one, you know, so, so here, here's what I've been doing. And I, and I, this is, I've been quietly doing this for about, uh, a month and a half or two months is uh, it's again, it's great to, to get top, top producers on the show, but I want this content to mean something to you. I want you to listen to this and go, yeah, you know what? That's something I can implement. You know, even if I don't have a budget or whatever, that's something I, I can implement. So, so we are, uh, we're taking a geographic approach now. And this, this dovetails very well with our radio thing because, um, you know, we're, 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 literally looking at the top 100 radio markets and going in. Now we are talking with the top producers there, but in some markets you can literally do a hundred deals and be top of the heap. Now, again, I know some of you guys are going, Toby, that's a lot. And it is a lot, but you'll get there. You will get there. Just keep listening to this show. So we're taking a geographic approach and I hope you like, uh, I hope, I, uh, I hope that content speaks to you. I, th- I hope that's that we can uncover more actionable nuggets that you guys can go, yep, I can do that today or I can do that, you know, I can set myself up for that next month or whatever it is. So that's it. Uh, um, uh, as a sponsor, you know what's up. Real estate radio experts. That's, I do not know why. We've been playing with names with the cartel because I want, you know, this is like a powerful, sexy group, right? The cartel. Some people had, did not like that name. Uh, I did. Um, you know, and they were like, I'll super agent radio, which is a little bit flat. So it's real estate radio experts. That's the name of our radio division. Uh, we just threw up the website. Uh, you can go to realestateradioexperts.com and uh, we put up like a simple, nice little scroll site. So check it out. And look, and here's the deal. Radio works. It is crazy how much radio works. If you look at across the nation, the people that are number one in the market all do radio. So how about you? You want to be number one? You know, get to a point, get to 40, 50, 60 transactions if you're in a small market. And, and dude, we'll get you on radio. I'll help you. So that's it. Let's get to the show. I hope you like it. Today on the show, I'm pretty excited. Uh, you know, as you guys know, I talk with you know, people who sell $150,000 houses. I talk with people who sell Beverly Hills houses. Today's guest is in the Hamptons, and, and obviously most of you know that Hamptons is ultra luxury. Uh, my guest today, his name is Vincent Orcasitas. Um, and I'll t- look, I have a little bio. Let me read it. So Vince is top 1% of brokers in the U.S., according to Wall Street Journal. 15 years selling luxury in the Hamptons, and he sold uh, properties for over uh, more than $1 billion. So he's in the $1 billion club. Last year, uh, his number was around $70 million. And uh, currently, Vince, in his listing, has more than 70 properties with a value of $280 million. I'm really excited to have Vince on the show. Hey, Vince, thanks for taking the time out today. Absolutely, I'm excited to be here and uh, and hope I can uh, add some uh, good input to your show. Yeah, absolutely. So, so listen, we we chatted for a few minutes before we started recording, and uh, you started to get tell me a little bit about your background. So let, let's jump into that now, because you know, in addition to to you know why you're so successful and you know and and what your business looks like, I'm always really 
intrigued by the person behind the company. So maybe give me a little overview of, of your background, and then, uh, and then we can talk about your company. Sure, sure. Um, so I, um, my father was a concert violinist and a professional highlight player. Um, I, have a, I grew up playing tennis, and I actually came out here uh, to the Hamptons. It's uh, kind of an interesting story. I'll, I'll, I'll keep it very short. Um, I, um, I came out here to run a tennis club. So I was, uh, I was out here directing as a, as a tennis pro, as a head pro of, a, uh, of, a, of the, one of the only indoor tennis clubs on the East End. Um, I used to work with the Davis Cup captain of the United States uh, out in uh, Palm Springs, California, and I ended up uh, coming out here and, and running a tennis club called the East Hampton Indoor Tennis Club. And I was doing that for about six, seven years, and I just uh, decided to get out of the uh, out of the tennis business and into uh, the real estate business. That was about 15 years ago, um, and I gradually built the business from selling uh, 15 years ago from selling homes of uh, 200, 300, 400 thousand dollars. Up to uh, I've, uh, one of the largest sales that I have is a, a $25 million teardown in uh, in the Southampton Village uh, area that was uh, a couple of years ago. Um, but that's sort of how I got into the into the business. My, uh, my my sort of my background is that you know I come from a poor family, and um, I you know I I, I appreciate uh, commonly out here in the Hamptons you know we're kind of uh, um, most people think it's only luxury, and every home is, uh, you know, four or five million dollars or, or more. And that's really not the case. There's uh, most of the uh, transactions that happen out here, uh, majority of them. There's uh, 40 to 50 um, real estate uh, transactions that happen every week out here, meaning properties that go into contract. And out of that 40 to 50 uh, transactions every week, uh, a good uh, 20 to 30 of those are under two million dollars. So um, there is a lot of high flying prices out here. You saw one of the largest, uh, the largest uh, transaction in the United States recently happened uh, last year, um, which was a property um, in East Hampton uh, that happened for I think 145 million dollars. So it's you know a lot of times the headlines if you're in a different state or uh, and you see these headlines you think everything is uh, is is is, um, is um, you yeah. know multi multi million dollars and that's actually not the case. So yeah yeah you know, some of my no, I was just gonna say, you know, I, so I've been out to the Hamptons, and I've, I actually was fortunate enough to stay in uh, this guy, the the guy who uh, developed Sesame Street. I ended up staying in his house for a week, and uh, and when I went out to the Hamptons events, I, I thought that I was gonna see you know all these giant crazy houses, and it's amazing. You, you you drive around and you can't see anything. There's giant hedges in front of like all the houses. Yeah, that's correct. I mean, it's uh, it's you know it's it's amazing when you get down into the estate sections of either. Southampton in the estate area, or you get into East Hampton in the estate area near the ocean. Um, you know, the, basically the area out here is, is divided. Either you're either north of the highway or you're south of the highway, and the difference between uh, the two is, is probably a 50% difference, which is um, what's fueled our market recently in the last couple of years is, is new construction. And just to touch a little bit on that is what's happened is, is a house that might be a few minutes north of the highway um, and it uh, could be, you know, it could be a new construction that could be anywhere from three to six million dollars. But if you were to pick up that house and move it uh, a mile or, or five minutes um, south of the highway, it could be as much as ten million dollars. So it's, uh, you know, that's that's, that's really uh, changed our market uh, recently here. Interesting. All right. Well, I want to get to that in a second. I want to. I'm going to go way, way back. I want to go way, way, way. I want to talk about your dad for a second because you, what you said was, you know, this guy is a concert violinist. And the guy plays highlight. Now, highlight is a, is a I, mean, I mean, that's a, that's a dangerous sport. That's a, that's a, you know, uh, uh, th- those two, those two personalities, concert violinist and and a highlight guy, those two personalities seem in in contrast to one another. Yeah, it's it's, it's pretty interesting. It's, it's that you're you're one of the first people that have mentioned it is a dangerous sport, and that's how my dad actually got out of it and stayed. My dad was always. Uh, learned the violin. He was brought up in uh, Mexico City. I was actually born in the United States, and my father was um, um, uh, was born in Los Angeles as well, but my dad's side of the family is Spanish uh, from Mexico. And, um, you know, it's just he got hit with a ball in the nose, actually, and that's how he got out of the highlight business. That's how I started in the tennis business, you know, got into tennis. I was, uh, you know, I had a, a, a full scholarship playing tennis, 
um, all through college, and I was inspiring to uh, be, be a professional tennis player. And actually, when I was younger, I used to beat uh, uh, Pete Sampras and Andre Agassi when they were 15 and 16 years old. Get out of here. Um, yeah, so, but I never made it in tennis, and I got into real estate. But, yeah, it is, it is uh, not to go off the subject, it is, that's, that's you know, my dad, uh, you know, got hit in the nose, got out of the highlight business, Got into uh, playing the violin. Was actually had a gig at the uh, at the Dunes Hotel before they tore it down and built the Bellagio, um, and was uh, was uh, was playing there at the Salt Table for about 25 years. So it's uh, it's uh, it's interesting how uh, one path takes you to uh, to another path. No, yeah, it's fascinating. And you know what I think is, you know, again, if if he had that, uh, you know, I, to me, I, I see on the concert the violinist side, I see this, you know, very deliberate, you know. Uh, kind of person and then and then with the highlight piece you know this this kind of wild you know uh you know car racing bullfighting kind of personality i just wonder if i just wonder for you how that kind of dual personality within your dad if i could say it that way that may not be a great way to express it but i i just wonder how that impacted you and the decisions you made as you as you grew up and uh and and chose a career or or chose um you know something your hobbies well I just, I just think what it is is more of a personality my dad is bigger than life if you talk to him he can talk to anybody at any given time and that's sort of the personality that just came on to me is, is it still from 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 my father i feel like i have a you know a personality i don't um i'm much better in uh conversations and writing down something and, and, and to somebody and i think i get that from my father because of my my dad's personality has a has a big personality. Eighty three years old, still playing tennis, is still getting around. Uh, you know, he's like a kid in a candy store at eighty three years old. So it's uh, I think a lot of that personality is what's made me successful in real estate because I have kind of a I'm very easy to talk to, very honest. I try to uh, with my clients. I try to uh, you know it's, it's sometimes they uh, you know people that uh, you know people that are um, a lot of times I, I I make them feel at ease that at a very short period of time in a conversation either either on the phone or in person just because I have uh, those communication skills and I get that I think through my uh, through my father through his personality. So okay, well I mean look okay, so uh, that's great. That's great to know. So you, you, I want to pick up on this, Vincent. You, you said well you know I talk with these people and make them feel at ease. Now, why in the world? I mean, I, I can see how that would help in many kinds of situations. But when you're dealing with somebody who's going to, you know, can buy a ten million dollar house, and by the way, if you're buying a ten million dollar house, those are all cash. So these are these are very very wealthy people. Um, I mean, do you think that your ability to? I mean, would those people even feel comfor- uncomfortable around a, a person like like me? I mean, I, I, I'm trying to. Understand that. Well, I just, I just think that, you know, you set people at ease, you know, knowledge is power. And if, when you have knowledge, people listen. You know, it's sort of like, you know, I used to uh, give you an example. I used to, and you can look up these names. I used to, I used to give tennis lessons to Harry Macklow, who's one of the major, uh, major uh, developers in the city, in New York City, skyscrapers, Carl Icahn. Oh, yeah. Uh, another major, major, major guy. Um, you know Carl? Uh, he, he, I know Carl personally. Yeah, wow. Stephen Schwartz, Stephen Schwartzman, who was in the stock. All these guys, and they were all trying to get something from me at the time. I was a tennis guy, and I was a very good tennis player, and they were trying to learn something from me. So I think when you have knowledge, um, whether it's in uh, whether it's tennis, trying to get somebody that's a, that's a billionaire that's trying to get something from you, or it's somebody that's you know you know asking you questions about a ten million dollar house. You know, for ten million dollars, you can buy most companies in the United States, let alone buying a a single family home. So I think when you when you when you um, when you're selling a home of ten million dollars, when you know the knowledge, whether it's the cost on the street or how the house is being constructed, it gives you knowledge that when you have a conversation with this person, they feel a little more at ease because they feel like they're not speaking to somebody that, that's not knowledgeable about what's going on. Whether you know, I think that's in any industry, but I think more in in real estate that. Is when you when you give somebody knowledge and you say you know you tell them five comps that are around their area and the reason why this is a good buy and uh, you're, you're you know it, it sets up, it sets them more at ease when you're having a conversation. Yeah, no, no, I completely agree. I you know I I, I so you, let's say okay, these guys are. I, I want to take the Carl Icahn for example, right? And this guy is a you know, American business guy. He's an investor in everything. He's in, into oil and real estate. He's into everything. A guy like that, 
you know, may not know some of the, some of the, the, the information you have on the comps or the street or, or whatever it might be. How do you, I, I'm curious about how you talk with a guy. I mean, I, I, I for me, Vincent, I, I think that, that I, I would be intimidated by the guy. Number one, number two, I would, I, I feel like I would not be able to talk to him like a regular person. And I would want to try to sound as smart as I could. And I may come off sounding like a complete idiot by doing that, but I, I, I I'm not sure even how I can formulate this question. I think you know what I'm getting at. Yeah, I, I think I think what it is in those situations is like I know I know him from a different situation where he's not in a business suit and I'm not up in his uh, you know I'm not in the Chrysler building on the on the 50th floor and he's sitting behind a desk in a suit and I'm coming in trying to um, you know sell him on something. I think you know I know him from him you know running around the tennis court trying to hit a tennis ball by right. me at the net. You know, and, and, and me trying to explain to him why he should be hitting the ball this way. So it's a little different approach when I when I'm meeting him or talking to him about um, about real estate. Let's say, and not all these guys are, are guys that are, are, are my um, are, are guys that I'm selling real estate. But just using it as an example, I think it's different when um, when when they know you in a different light. Um, so I think that helps when you when you're talking to people of that nature. And I think. You know, um, when you, when, you know, m- most of the business out here, there's, you know, there's either two types of buyers out here. You either have somebody that we call in the business an end user, where they're looking to, where they're looking to buy the house for, you know, for the family and they plan on using it for five to ten years and then maybe down the line they might pass it on in the family and they don't have to, you know, it's in the distant future if they'll ever sell the house. That's one buyer. The other buyer is purely looking at buying it and wants to know, as a speculative type of thing, whether they're going to buy it for, for, for Y, and if they put if they put Z into the property, uh, you know, as soon as the paint dries at the end, they want to know if, if there's a 25 percent kicker in the deal. So yeah. they're, you know, those are the type of guys that like a, like a business guy that comes out here. They want to know what they're doing, and those are the two type of buyers that come out here. So I think if you can break it down to a um, uh, break it down in a conversation, I try to simplify things. Is is is, is dumbing it up. Not that you would need to dummy it up to a guy that's, you know, somebody that has $10 million and less than inherited the money, they've got the $10 million because of a reason. Most of the reason is that they're pretty damn smart and they know what they're doing. So I try to keep it very simple and, um, and, 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 and break it down in a very simple way for them. Got it. Okay. You know, you know, and, and look, I, 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 I don't want to kill this Carl Icahn thing, but I want to go back because I think you said something that, that is really important and, and I think something that, that my audience can, can, you know, one nugget they can take away, and it's this. You know, I talk with a lot, of, a lot of very successful guys on this show, and a lot of them have big, big egos. And, and, and you said to me, you said, you know, Carl Icahn, you know, I knew him from running around the court and asking me how to hit the ball. And, and what I've seen with people, very successful people, not like – a Carl Icahn, because I don't know the guy, but but those people are they're humble, they're teachable, um, they're coachable, and I think too many people who who haven't gotten there yet, uh, they, I don't know, their ego stops them from being teachable, from being coachable, from being humble. What, what, what's your take on that, Vince? Well, that's, that's true. You know, I mean, today in the information highway, I think too many times uh, most people that come into the business, you know, uh, try they over they overthink the situation. Sometimes more information isn't good enough. Uh, an example would be is if you came inside a house and the house happened to have a pink bedroom painted. And if you came inside the thing and you're a lot of times, well, brokers will go, oh, geez, I really don't like, you know, you, you know the, the, the opinion is a lot of times uh, <clears throat> less is better and, and more isn't as good because when you come into the room, you're not, you're not saying, hey, I don't like, if you don't, before, they, before the client says anything, you're not saying, hey, I don't like the color pink. You're not saying anything. They might love the club of pink, and they might think it's the best thing in the world. So why would you say, why would you voice your opinion in that situation? So I guess getting back to your question, a lot of times, if you if you overthink the situation, it, it, it doesn't help you. And I don't know if that really answered your question, but that's sort of my thinking. I, I, an example is I used to have an assistant uh, <clears throat> six, seven years ago, or it could even be more, it could be more like 10 years ago, and she was, like, brilliant. The girl was brilliant, but she wasn't, she was horrible at, at sales, just because she didn't, you know, she over-calculated and overthought it and, 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 and didn't dummy it down to just, you know, maybe really simplifying it in, in a very simple fashion. And that's, that's what I think one of my, you know, if I was to toot my horn about something, what I'm, what I'm very good at is really dummying it down and 
simplifying it into a, uh, into a, a very simple way that somebody can understand it instead of overcomplicating the situation. Got it. Got it. Well, let me ask you this. So, you know, being out in, uh, being out in, um, you know, in, in the Hamptons and, you know, you, you, you can't, uh, you know, there are people on this sh- that's come on the show that, you know, has gotten, they've gotten very wealthy by door knocking. Now you can't, I don't think you can do that in the Hamptons cause you have gates and stuff, but how does somebody like you or, or someone who, who, you know, wants to tackle Beverly Hills or Pebble beach or, or, you know, or, or, pro- you know, sell properties that are similar to your market how do you meet these people to even, you know, be able to dumb it down and deliver the knowledge that you have amassed? Well, I just think a lot of it is, you know, it's, it's years, you know, most successful brokers that you talk to, unless, um, you know, unless it's, um, unless it's somebody that's just, you know, um, that's done very well at a very short period of time, it's, it's a link that you've been in the business. I mean, you know, I think if you take the top, you know, any top broker, if you took the, you know, the top five brokers that are on the Wall Street Journal and ask them, each one of them, how long they've been involved in the business, and I'll guarantee you that they'll say, I've been in the business for 20 years, I've been in the business for 25 years. You know, it's relationships that you build over a year after year over time in the, in the business, you know, and, 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 and certainly out here in this, uh, in this market or any major market, if you're controlling the inventory, you're controlling the buyers. Yeah. Vince? Yes. Yeah, so you're just controlling the buyers when you control the inventory. Yeah, right. I, I, I 100%. So, so how do you um, – what does – I guess if I think of the Hamptons, do you have – how many people – what's the – So, you're, so you're, your question to me was just to go back over. You're saying how do I uh, – uh, how do you get those type of buyers? Well, you know, uh, you know I, I, a long time ago, about 10 years ago, I was on a panel. And, um, and uh, it, was very, it was very, I'm not a great public speaker, and I was in front of about a thousand new agents that were coming on, and I was up on this panel with four, four speakers, and I had these microphone, and I had this, this, uh, this um, a tie on that was, you know, wrapped around my neck, a sweat <laughs> bullet, and I just was like, oh my God, what am I going to say, how am I going to, you know, they had, me, they, they had me on this panel, you know, and they went, you know, it's the last guy to speak on it, so they came to the first person, and they're like, ah, you sold sold fifty million dollars worth of real estate last year. You're the, you know, you're the uh, rookie of the year. And what do you contribute your, uh, you know, to your success to? And it's this long-winded, ten-minute convert, you know, speeches about how great they are and what they did to become this, and you know, everything. You know, that. So I was the last one. I had to listen to three of these speeches, and uh, and the guy who was, you know, had the had the microphone in his hand. He came up to me afterwards, and I was like petrified to even talk at the time. And he goes, uh, he goes, Vince, you know, you sold $100 million worth of real estate last year. What do you contribute your uh, sales to last year? And how, how, how did you become so success- successful? And I said, I was like I said, I was really nervous. I said, when my phone rings, I answer it. Yeah. Whenever, whenever it rings, I answer it. So, you know, as, as dumb as that sounds, if you, could be, you could run a test now and you could call up six agents right now, pick up a phone and call six agents and look at, watch how many agents actually pick up their phone. 6.30 on a, what is it, uh, today, Tuesday night, call six agents and see how many out of those six agents actually pick up their phone. And I'll guarantee you that there'll be four of them wouldn't answer the phone, and you might even get five of them. There might only be one agent out of those six agents. The rest of them will go into their voicemail. Yep. I picked up, I picked up my phone uh, last summer, or two summers ago, I can't remember, and a phone call came in, and it was a, it was a, it was a Dutch guy on the phone, and I sold the guy a $25 million property. Oh, I picked up my phone. I answered my phone when it rang, and it's, 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 you know, and the crowd went crazy afterwards. They thought it was just tremendous because it was like five words I said. I, I pick up my phone and answer, answer, and that's all I said. And um, so it's just, you know, it's like, you know, so, so I, I, think, um, I think sometimes just the simplest things in real estate make you successful. Yeah, no, I, I look. I, I agree, and I think too many people, uh, you know, uh, too many people always they're they're looking for that silver bullet. Okay, what's that one marketing thing I can do, or what's that one mailer? Well, you know, that I can send out, and and you know, they want to optimize for the least input and maximum output. You know, and it it just it doesn't work like that. So no, but- you're you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. Ninety five percent of what you do in real estate is a total waste of time. Only that five percent that you do is actually accumulates accumulates into something that that makes sense. So uh, for you, Vince, I mean, do you uh, you know being in the market that you're in and and the price points that you have and and uh, you know and I guess I have to throw in that you've been at this for you know a decade and a half. 
I mean, other than answering your phone, what are some of the things that that's working for you and your business right now? You know, um, right now, actually, we're just in the, in the forefront. It's, it's, it's treating the business like a business. For a long time, I, 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 you know, I'm getting better at my game. I, I always bring it back to tennis because I was such a, you know, tennis has been such an inspiration in my life. It's like, you know, if your backhand is weak and you're losing matches because the guy hitting, you know, that you can't hit the third ball over on, on your backhand side over the net, it's the same thing in real estate. So what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to get better. I'm, I'm building a business plan. Um, you know, I'm working on where my leads are coming in from. Mm -hmm. Um, there's not one thing, like you said, that, uh, that does it. So there's, there's many things that do it. Um, you know, building a bigger, uh, internet, you know, as you know, uh, most of your leads, um, come from the internet. I do, a, I do a lot of cold calling, call up a lot of clients that I've, uh, that I've sold properties to in the past and, uh, have conversations with them about, you know, just touching base and, um, and most of the time, you know, I, the more you pick up, you know, the more you pick up the phone, and the more that you, the, the more rocks you unturn or overturn, the more, uh, the more, the, you know, the, the harder the work, harder I work, the more successful I am. So I spend an immense amount of time working. I probably spend seven to ten hours a day um, working in real estate, usually seven days a week. So I work a little bit harder than the than you know. I, that's again coming from my tennis background. I just figured if I uh, if I spent more time and I hit more tennis balls than my opponent, I was going to be better than them. So I kind of instill that same um, type of work ethic into into my real estate. Uh, the more hours that I work, the harder I work at it. Um, I'm trying to be more selective in the way I do the, the way I work. But I spend a, an immense amount of time. Um, um, it just there's, there's not one thing that I do. It's, it's been a, a, you know, a, a, among a lot of things that I do. Yeah, um, man. Well, no, look, I, you know, I, I can appreciate that that illustration. You know, just get get the ball over the net. But let me let me say this. I think I don't I don't know your market. I've not been there. But but what I've seen here's what I my gut tells me would be really effective. And and I could be completely wrong. In your market is 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 community around there, right? So if you have, if you have, you know, all these wealthy people, they live in Manhattan, right? And they come out, they're on Wall Street and they come out for the weekend, you know, three-day weekends or whatever. Um, you know, everybody wants to know everybody else. It seems like if you could throw, you know, you don't have to be throw Gatsby-like parties, but you know what I mean? Like, like build community. Yeah, well, so for, for instance, like, you know, just give you an example. So what I did the other day is I had an open house on them. Um, I currently represent the uh, designer showcase house, uh, the Hampton Designer Showcase House for um, for the Hamptons this last summer, 2013. Hmm. Um, very good cause. All the money goes to the um, to the Children's Hospital, um, Cancer Hospital here in Southampton. Um, and the, the the entry, you pay thirty dollars, you get through the door, you get to see a, a brand new house. It's, uh, this particular house was uh, listed for thirteen five. Um, you know, it's a twelve thousand square foot house, beautifully done. Um, you know, inside and out between people, you know, from the landscaping to the, uh, the paint color inside. And that particular house, after the, sh after the showcase was uh, done, I got a hold of, um, um, I got a hold of uh, Maserati and Ferrari of Long Island and had, uh, had cars lined up in front of the house and had a test drive of the cars and threw a, a broker's open house with, uh, you know, catered food and a, and a test driving of the cars. And I had that in the paper. And we had that, uh, you know, sent out in social media. And, um, you know, that was just, you know, just another way to get some people. And through that, um, I think I have somebody that's uh, going to buy the house now. So it's just you never know where the um, where it's going to come from. You try to, uh, like you see in the, in the uh, you know, uh, millionaire uh, listing or any of these other types of things. You, you know, they try to get creative with the way that they uh, bring people in. And, you um, that was just one of the gimmicks on this particular house. That's that's a great gimmick, man. Um, uh, I mean, I mean, being able to test drive a Ferrari. I mean, come on, that's incredible. Yeah, no, it was great. It was great. It was very well received. We got a lot of people, and it was uh, it was a lot of fun. It was, it was a lot of fun. But you know, there's many th there's many things um, that you know get done on that. But we just really try to get on it, you know. And I just think the response time. You know, it's just, you know, again, like the, the conversation of calling six brokers up and seeing which one picks up their phone. You can do that with an email as well. You can send an email and you might not get a response from some agent for 48 hours. That's too late. You know, the, the buyer is looking. And if you contact them immediately, a lot of times you can have a conversation with them and say, are you working with an agent? 
oh, you're not working with an agent. Well, let me, um, let me, uh, you know, I'm an expert in this area. Let me show you uh, what I can do for you. And it's just a way that you can kind of, um, you know, you know, if you don't respond to the person for 48, ah, I've already got the information, and they're already working with another broker. So it's really in this day and age, it just seems, really seems like it would be, you know, everything. Um, data and internet, you, you just really have to be on it, like immediately. It's, it can't oh, be. It can't yeah, yeah. Be, you know. no. I, I think you really have like a two to two minute window. You know, you have a ninety two to three minute window. You know, somebody calls you, got to You should pick up and or get it back. But let me. I want I'm I'm I, I'm really intrigued, man. So so what you said going way back, you said, hey, listen, you know, there are. I think you said you started selling two hundred to four hundred thousand dollar homes. Did I get that right? Yeah, that's correct. Okay, how did you move up, man? How do you go from two hundred k to twenty five million? Like, like, was that just one day you, yeah. you sold a $5 million house just, and you said? It was, it, was, it was just a phase. Originally when I got in it, I just, you know, I was trying to sharpen my skills. You know, I think that the more transactions that you do, the better you get at it. And I was just, you know, was, I was still, uh, you know, just freshly finished with, you know, with, uh, I wanted to try something different. I got into the real estate. I, I was, again, like I said, I'm, I, I have, uh, you know, very good personal, um, uh, personal skills. And um, I was just, uh, that was the market at the time. It was, it was um, back then, you know, a lot of people were just looking to, if these were first, first time home buyers that were looking to buy these, um, buy these homes. And, uh, and I just jumped at it. I, uh, you know, in, in, engrossed myself in the business and I was working probably 12 hours a day back then. Um, you know, that, that my life was just, uh, was all about real estate. So, and then it just, it just kind of, it just kind of escalates. I, I built my mm. business, you know, went from there to, you know, selling uh, parcels of land for five hundred thousand dollars or a million dollar lots that the homes were being sold for two or three million dollars there, and then it just escalated into, you know, where I'm selling, uh, you know, three four million dollar, five million dollars of land and, and and selling ten to thirteen million dollar homes, and it just it just you know it could be ocean fronts. I've been you know sold a, a couple different ocean front properties, same type of scenario. It just kind of escalates into that for where all of a sudden, you know, when you have listings that are $13 million, you're getting calls by buyers that are interested in, you know, whatever it's $13, $15 million, and then you're taking that customer, you get yourself familiar, they are familiarized with, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with a different product that, that's, um, you know, that's more expensive, and, and um, you just, you know, it just, it just kind of keeps going. You know, so, I, I don't know how. Yeah, yeah. It, 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 no, it, you have to sometimes look back. I don't always look back on, you know, you know. I, I get people all the time giving me compliments on it, and I don't really, it doesn't really soak in. Every once in a while, I hear myself talk, and I'm like, oh, wow, I guess I do know what I'm talking about, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah, I am a, a successful smart guy. Uh, but yeah. have you ever tried? It seems it seems to me like, um, um uh, if I was in your shoes, right, and I'm selling a you know, million dollar land, and I know, you know, I, I have this deep, deep knowledge in the marketplace, and I know that we can build some, build something on there, and and you know, sell it for ten or five or whatever. It seems like that's a different kind of a business where you could be, you could, you know, meet some investors and go, hey, look, guys, I'm going to spend my time, I'm going to find a piece of land that's a great deal, and I, I don't want a commission from it, I, you know, but I want a split, right? I want a piece of the upside. Do you ever play with that at all? Uh, you mean being an investor in the deal as, as well? Is that what you're yeah, well, well, I mean, yeah, you can be, you can either throw money in, or you could throw your time in and say, listen, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna source the the land, right? Kind of be a scout, right? I'm gonna source the land, make sure it's a good deal, um, you know, and then I'll I'll buy it, I'll take no commission, or put my commission back into the deal, and then I'll sell it and put my commission back into the deal, or whatever. But I want, I want an upside, a piece of the upside. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm... And, uh, I've, I've built a few homes, and um, I'm, uh, I've been uh, involved in uh, I've been involved in that. But you know, it's not really my cup of tea. I don't. Mm. I don't. You know, I think that there's a fine line between uh, um, be, between being a, a broker and being a builder, um, or being an investor. I don't think it really goes hand in hand. And I'm really it's something that I'm really not uh, comfortable even getting into because. Just look at it. This is the way I look at it, and this is how a lot of them out here, anyway, a lot of investors look at it. I mean, you know, if all of a sudden you're presenting them with a with a with a particular property, um, you know, and, and they know that you're a builder or you're an investor yourself, why are you pitching them for the property? Right. Why aren't 
taking the property. So it's really, a, I, I kind of find it a conflict of interest, and I'm really, it's something that I'm uh, not, you know, I, I, I'm uh, not comfortable getting into. I'm not saying that I haven't done it in the past, and, and um, I'm just, I'm, I'm trying to, you know, if anything, I'm trying to, to, to lend out of there. I might build my own personal home, something like that, but I'm, uh, it's not something that I, uh, that I think, I think it becomes a conflict of interest. You have to disclose it. Um, you know, every time that you show the house, because it's, uh, you know, the Department of State thing, if you don't disclose that you're involved in the property prior to uh, showing it. So, uh, I, I don't know, I hope that answers your question. But, yeah, yeah. you know, is, well, is it lucrative, and is there, is, is there a lot of brokers that are arguing that? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, no, I just wanted to get a sense of, you know, of, of the breadth of, of the, and the scope of what you do. So, um, I just had a great question, and I totally, I, I totally lost it. Um, God. Well, let me let me do this. Let me do this because I, you know, I really, I think you have a lot to your background. I mean, this is this is a crazy question, um, but just I'll see where it goes and hopefully have an answer. But we've covered a bunch of ground here. What's something I didn't ask you, Vincent? That again, because you've 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 been around. Well, I, for think, a while. I think I think we could I think we could touch a little bit. Just it's not all about me. You know, I have a team of um, of of of, 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 um, of people that help me. Um, you know, I have a guy named Robert Tremundo who's, um, who's been with me for eight years. He um, started doing open houses for me, and now he's uh, selling properties. He just recently uh, sold, like, three properties in the last month, um, a couple million and a half to two and a half million dollar properties. And, you know, I feel very confident. I, he, he came from a sales background, but I kind of caught up the business. And, you know, he's been working with me for about eight years now. I have a, a Tatiana that's uh, here with me as well that just started working with me. That's, you know, working on my um, social media and a bunch of other um, types of things. And then, uh, you know, so I have, you know, three, four people that I can plus, you know, you're only as good as your company. The company, I uh, to touch base on it, I, I worked for Prudential Douglas Elliman for about 12 years, and I've moved over to um, Saunders & Associates about uh, coming up on three years. And my, do- my business doubled um, when I moved here because um, one of the reasons is they have a million-dollar um, advertising, uh, um, in-house advertising firm that uh, handles everything from doing the brochures in- in-house where they don't source it out. Um, we have three writers. We have two, uh, you know, four photographers. And, um, the, you know, the, the marketing um the marketing team here is exceptional, much better than um, I would say any um, you know boutique firm, which is grown. When I first came to the company, there was only uh, there was only 90 agents um, doing 43 percent of the market share with less than 10 percent of the brokers. So figure that one out for a second. So there's a thousand brokers out here. There, we only had 10 percent of the brokers. We only had 100 brokers, but we were doing 40 43 percent of the market share. So that just gives you an idea. We have a, a mass amount of good brokers in one house, plus we have a powerhouse marketing team to uh, kind of behind me. So it's, it's very easy when I go on a listing presentation or what, when I bring in off my team, which is, uh, you know, we have a, a head of marketing here. We have, you know, we're, 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 we're you know, my, in my opinion, leaps and bounds above the competition, which, you know, if I was to touch on my team, and, and also the, uh, the, the the company that I'm working for really um, really helps me to be. Okay. Okay. So so you think having a team and, and having a, a you know a, a marketing section and all that stuff is is I mean I mean what percentage of of your success came from I, I don't want you to answer for the team because I don't want you to, 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 to negate anybody's efforts but uh, again you have this marketing team who does all the brochures and all that stuff I mean how important really is that I mean you, you know you can outsource that to you know Vista print yeah I think I think I think it's very good I mean I, I, I think uh, when you look you know, you know our, our branding the branding of, uh, of, of Saunders uh, company stands out uh, you know you're not out there so it's hard to show you but when we go into a listing presentation um, and we show the pictures, and we, we walk into the presentation with an aerial photo and um, photographs of the uh, of the property prior to the um, to the uh, listing presentation, and, and you know we show what we do as a marketing team when we have a and we have a marketing um, uh, um, plan for them prior to uh, walking into the meeting. It really just you know it's, it's not a you know as, as simple as that might sound. Um, it's not always done. I mean, you know, most most you know most mom and pop uh, operations, or even the non mom and pop operations, they don't they don't have a marketing plan 
Yeah. They have an agent that maybe has a small budget or maybe has no budget at all. And um, he's telling the owner that, hey, I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to list your property. I'm going to have a few open houses. Doesn't tell them when, when it's being advertised, where it's being advertised, how much money you're going to spend in the period of time that you're listing the property. And, um, you know, when we come in, when we show them a, a you know, a colorful uh, brochure, a, a, a marketing plan, an aerial shot of the, of the, of, of the house, and it just, you know, it, it, it stands out well above them as far as listing the property. And, you know, the team is a help, and I can't do it all myself. I have 50 or 60 listings, so can you imagine running around doing, you know, opening doors and returning emails and doing all the things that you have to do with, uh, with 50 or 60 listings? It's a lot, and, and you need a team behind you to be able to, um, uh, you know, to, to get, get your arms around the business. Got it. Okay, man, we're going to start wrapping up, uh, Vince. I, um, and here's, here's the, I'm going to ask you the last two questions I ask everybody, and here's the first one. I'm an aspiring agent. I have 25 bucks. What book should I go buy today? Ooh, that's a tough, <laughs> tough one. You know, as funny as it is, I've never read a book on real estate. Yeah, well, you know what? There's probably like two good ones. You know, I, um, I, I would take the, uh, I would, I, I would, uh, I would, if you know that question after, you know, I don't have an answer to that question. Um, so I've never read a book on real estate. So um, I'll, I, um, I'll, I'll tell you. I'll, I really don't have it. I don't really don't have yeah, no. Yeah. I'll tell you what. I'll tell you the book that I that that I would have. A lot of times, I can I can talk with somebody for you know forty minutes and get a sense of what they're going to say. And just just from a lot of the stuff that you you touched on with your you're great with relationships. You're not afraid to talk with people. You know, you make people feel at ease. I would have thought that you would have said Dale Carnegie's How to Win Friends and Influence People. Yeah, okay. All right. So I look at. Tatiana's here and she read, so, uh, so I'll get her to uh, pass the book over to me. Yeah, do it. And I'll tell you, I'll tell you, get, so, so everybody in the audience, if you haven't read that book, that's, that's a go-to book that you should read every year, at least once. And you can get a free copy if you don't have it. Just use our link, audibletrial.com slash superagentslive. Go get a free copy. It's on Audible. Um, and my last question to you is, you know, early on, you worked 12 hours a day today, even after all your stunning success events, you know, uh, doing a hundred million dollars. I mean, all this stuff, you have $268 million or whatever in your pipeline today. Why are you still pushing, man? And, and, and do, is there a personal habit that you have that you feel has contributed to your success? Yes. I always try to give myself goals. And uh, every year, my goal is uh, something different. So, um, you know, I, um, I wake up every day and, and, and say to myself, what am I going to sell today? That's what I wake up every day to. And, uh, you know, it, it, it's um, why am I still working this amount of hours? Because my business is ready to boom. I'm just, I'm just starting out. It's, I'm ready to take it to the next level. This is just the start. And well, hold on. And so, and before we sign off, what's the next level to you? Are you? I mean, you're looking for two hundred million, or, or you know? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. My next level is um, is is, is two hundred million. I'm, I'm currently working on a um, on a major deal, um, couple couple hundred million dollar deal right now that I'm very close to uh, putting together. Wow. And um, you know, it's uh, it's um, you know, that's what it's what gets me up into going. So what most what most agents do, I would say, one of the shortfalls that most people do is. They get into real estate, they do a couple deals, um, and they stop. They all of a sudden say, oh, look at this, I have this money, what am I going to do with it? Let me go take a vacation. You know, it just, it, it, it inspires me. I have a bell in my office, and every time I get a, bell, a, a signed contract or close it, I take the bell out and I ring it. And it just goes, it, 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 uh, as dumb as it might sound, it's just something that, it, you know, it's not all about the money. It's really more about just doing the transaction. Yeah. Like, I don't care if they're big or small. I just get excited. It's something that makes me excited about doing transactions. I, 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 I uh, you know, some people get excited about eating ice cream. I get excited about signing contracts. Oh, dude, I lo- I'm a deal junkie, too. I love it. I love it. Um, so, so uh, I, I don't ask people this question, but I'm curious about you. Um, so, I mean, are you, uh, what do you drive out there in the Hamptons? I mean, do, do you, do you test drove those Ferraris, but do you have one in your garage? You know, I have a Maserati. I just got the Gidlin 4S. Good for you. Yeah. And I, um, I just got it and I love it. It's got a Ferrari engine in it. It's, uh, it's a great car. You know, it's, it's, it's a car it's a Ford for. 
and uh, and you can put you can put uh, you know you can put a you can put a it's a car that you can take clients up to and uh, and 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 definitely uh, you can drive it around. It's not uh, it's, it's it's a car that's not like a like a four fifty eight Spider that you, you you can only put a thousand miles on in a year. Yeah, and well, and the other thing too is, man, I, I've had I've I've owned Ferraris before. I had a um, I had an old uh, well, it was it was gorgeous to me. I had an eighty nine uh, three twenty eight GTB, which is basically Tom Selleck's Tom Selleck's um, Ferrari, but it didn't have the didn't have the T top things. So it was a hard top. But today I'm a Porsche guy. But here's what I found. So so I have a couple Porsches today. When I drive my when I drove my Ferrari, I would get looks on the freeway like you're a dick. But when I drive my Porsche, and my Porsche is gorgeous, I you know I I, I have a Cayenne, I've had, I've had two nine elevens, um, and but you know you know what I mean? Like everybody's like, oh, that's just another Porsche. So I would never. I sometimes I think about getting another Ferrari, but I don't I don't think I'd get one. And I think a Maserati falls in the middle. There, that thing's it's a gorgeous car, but it's it's very uh, it's very low key. Yeah, I have a Range Rover. Right here, it's, you know, the weather's really bad, and I and I use the Range Rover. This is the, 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 the Maserati is just something that I'm uh, driving around, but, I, you know, I, I'm driving off-road a lot, and I, I have a, 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 you know, Range Rover Sports are great. You know, you're driving around, you can't, uh, you can't beat them up, and uh, they're, they're very safe. Absolutely. Well, listen, I, I, uh, here's, here's the deal, Vincent. I, I encourage my audience, if they've gotten anything out of this episode with, with you and I, and I know that you, you know, you're a busy guy, so I I appreciate you taking the time out. I encourage my audience to, to reach out to you and say thank you. I want to be the first guy. I'll say, hey, Vincent, thanks for taking the time out and coming on. Where can people find you and say thanks? Um, people can find me. They can email me at bh at saunders.com. And I'll spell that out, bh at s-a-u-n-d-e-r-s dot com. Or they can um, go on to my website, which is uh, vincentthehampton.com. Got it. Perfect. All right, man. And for everybody out there, if you're driving and you couldn't get that, uh, write it down. Just go to the show notes. Uh, it'll all be there, superagentslive.com, and uh, look for Vince Hor Casitas. Casitas. Um, and uh, it'll all be there. Hey, Vincent, thanks for taking the time out today. Let's keep in touch. Anytime, Bob. Appreciate it. Thank See you, bud. You. See you. Bye. Let's go. 